Hello everyone, it's Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo here today for State of the Game 11. Now we're going to do some house cleaning first. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we, well, what I put out to you last week, which was a question, would you mind me talking about other games? Overwhelmingly, if you look through all the comments, and I can send you my PMs and my emails, you all said that you wouldn't mind if I started to talk about other games. Now, there were many of you that said, as long as it stays in the same genre, and I do agree with you. Some of you did say that you would mind, but I will make sure that I timestamp things in the future so you know where you can listen to the pieces about Star Citizen, and then you could fast forward to the items about, or fast forward over the items that I might have about Elite Dangerous. But this week, I have to contrast the two games. And I'll get to those two things that I'm going to contrast in just a little bit. The first thing I want to talk about is going to be last week's Hangar Flare contest. I've been trying to do them in different videos for the longest time, and it's just another video I have to shoot, just another video I have to schedule, just another video I have to upload, and another video you all have to share. So I'm going to lighten the load, and I'm going to go right to talking about who won this week's Hangar Flare contest, okay? So just give me a second, and we will get right into that. All right, here I am over at Random Name Picker. Now, somebody said that they noticed that a couple of people were winning that had spaces between their name, and to check that out, put about 50 names in here and I kept on hitting the button and each time a different name went, you know, came up. Then I looked back over the winners. Yeah, Sam has won twice, APCR um, 01 has won and a couple of the people with single names, but there have been people with two names that have won also with the space in them. Um, let's just say that there was B. Hoffner, I think Hoffner, well, he won the Super Hornet, and uh, well, we'll just see what happens from here, okay? So this week, I am giving away the bar where you can drink and get drunk at, and we're just going to pick a name here and see what happens. And the winner, look, see, a name with a space in it, Steven Samuelson. Congratulations. I have your email. I will get this to you ASAP, okay? Awesome, right? So let's move on to the next piece, all right? And the next piece is going to be, um, I want to talk a little bit about what Chris Roberts has said in a recent interview in PC Magazine UK. Now this was sent to me, and if I have to go through all my emails, I apologize, but it was sent to me by one of my viewers today. And uh, he essentially said, take a look at this and see what you think. And uh, immediately I said, that just doesn't, makes sense to me and I'll explain to you what I mean and I'm trying to find him in my list over here let's see I want to see who sent this to me well I don't want to hold this this one of my videos up so if I do not correctly give credit to the person that sent this to me I do very much apologize because it seems like I may have deleted the email nonetheless Chris Roberts had an interview in PC Magazine UK this month's issue, and I had to go out to the newsstand in my iPad and pay for a one-month subscription. It's actually two months. You get one month free, and then you pay for one. I got this issue and immediately started to read it, and there was an amazing article in there and a couple of insightful items in there. But one of the things that I was being pointed to by this viewer and I do apologize again, please comment below and I'll make sure you get credit for it. this, is that there was something in here that was talking about the amount of money that Star Citizen has gathered, has, has brought in. And in one piece of it, it says this. All right, let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you a whole paragraph and then some. I start by asking if the money raised is enough. It's never enough, he laughs. We scale development according to how much money is coming in. The level of support dictates our level of ambi ambition. This is a huge open world game where you can go from planet to planet so we could spend hundreds of millions of dollars on it quite easily. As well as the funds raised by backers, Robert Studios, Cloud Imperium Games. 
will be investing 100 million of its own money into the project. It'll be at least another 18 to 20 months before the game is ready for release, so whatever we raise in that time will also be put into the development. All right, I'm a little confused. This is a crowdfunded game, and if Roberts, if Chris Roberts' company, Cloud Imperium Games, has $100 million to invest, that's $160 million. It's a huge budget for a game, is it not? And was the money brought to them by investors? How did they get it? That's my question. I wonder if there's a couple of things that were not really 100% noted in here. Like maybe what he said is they expect to have 100 million raised by the 18 to 20 months when the game goes live. So I'm a little bit confused as to where and what they're talking about. There's a couple of other pieces in here that made me pause for a second. Game mechanics, you know, the death of a spaceman. There were a couple of cool things that you could read in this, and this is a good read. This whole article is a very good read. But I'm very much um, fascinated with how much Chris, how much respect he has for all of us. That's where I'm going to go now, okay? So the first piece of today is $100 million dollars. And this is going to be for this week's contest. So we just gave away one bar, and I'm going to give away another one of those bars. And all you have to do to get it is put SOG11 Hangar Flare Contest inside of the subject field of an email that you send to the addictedgamer at gmail.com. And then inside the email, you must tell me if you think that that is correct, did they, do they really have $100 million of their own money that they're investing, or do you think that was a misquote? That's all I want you to do in that email. And I'll pick a random name on SOG12 next week and give away the bar. And I'll tell you this, if you don't want the bar, I'll give, you away, any pe I'll give away any piece of hanger flare that you want. Okay? So... The second piece of this is going to be the ship sale, okay? They're going to raise some money. Last year, I think they raised between 5 and $7 million. I did a video a week. I highlighted each one of the ships as they went up for sale. I think it was the military um, ship's sale that was the hardest one on me because I had to go through the Retaliator, the Hornet, the Gladiator. But they raised a lot of money, and this year, they're doing it again. But I don't see the buy-in. There's at least another 100,000 backers since last year. So this is the piece that gets me about this article. They talk about ship prices. And they talk about how they came up with the initial cost of a ship price. And they use the constellation as an example. And the constellation was given away as a gift for pledging at the $275 level. It wasn't that the ship cost $275. It's that for people that, in, that, that invested $275 into the game, they got this ship. So I think this is where my opinion is that Cloud Imperium Games made their first mistake. Was actually taking that ship and giving it a cost of $250 or $225, whatever it was. Because they felt if they gave it a cost of $40 or $30 or $100, it would slight the people that backed the game at the $275 level. I understand that. And now we're kind of stuck in the middle of this world where we've now done a reset on microtransactions and turned them into macro transactions and into hardcore real estate transactions with something like the Javelin that's going to cost $2,500. So I look at that initial sale, that initial when they changed it from a pledge into the sale of a ship as being the, not the downfall of CIG, I think it was a spectacular marketing decision. But for us, for those of us that are playing the game, it all of a sudden put a hardcore high dollar value 
on assets that are virtual, that are made out of ones and zeros, that aren't real, that you can't touch, you can't feel, you can't covet, and you can't sell. Think about that. $275 of your money, and you can't sell it. Well, legally, or within the rules of Cloud Imperium Games. Okay, you know how I feel, because I have a lot of ships, and it hasn't stopped me buying them. But it does give me a moment of pause to think about that over and over and over again. And they actually talked about the gray market just a tad bit there, which is, I don't think that CIG gets it in this way. They say that it's not going to be a big deal, this LTI. And I agree with them, kind of, sort of, because there's going to be newer models of every ship and better ships as time goes on. And LTI on a ship that you might not use very much two years from now won't matter. And I think that's why they're doing the two-year insurance on the current sale items. But think about spending that much money with the fear that somebody could hijack it or steal it from you. And just by forgetting, unintentionally forgetting to buy insurance before your mission, you lose an asset that you spent that much money on. Now, there's going to re be a reset of prices once the game goes live. And I ask you this. Say you spend $275 on a ship. Say you spend $500 on a ship. Say you spent $800 on a ship. And you find out that $800 ship only takes 60 hours of play in the game to get. How do you feel? Is it still worth the $800 that you spent? That's the part that's scary to me. It's not, is the ship worth it? Because I think many of us, many of y'all, feel that whatever you spend on the ship is worth it. But once it transitions from real US dollars, euros, British pounds, rubles, rupees, whatever they are, francs, marks, once it transfers from these hard currencies into UE credits, UEC, United Earth Credits. What are you going to think of the purchase that you made with real money? Was it worth it? All right, I'm going to move on from here. So we have this big ship sale, and you have all of this attention on CIG from us. And in walks Frontier Development, and they do their big event on Saturday, which I'm still yet to watch. I need to go and find it. And I get home, and what's waiting but the Gamma release, which I will call Release Candidate 1 of Elite Dangerous. Total reset, so everything I've done in the past is now reset. But from what I understand, if you're a backer and you're in this part of the testing, which is the Gamma testing, which is the Release Candidate testing your progress from here on out will be saved. It won't be reset again. I hope I'm not wrong, but that's my understanding at this point. And believe me, folks, I've been wrong before. So I jumped into the game yesterday for two hours, and so far I put up the first two episodes of those two hours I spent. I lost probably about 30 minutes of footage before that. I actually played for two hours and 30 minutes. And I came out of it delighted. The game works. The game's not buggy so far. It could be for some. It was not for me. And it was kind of fun. But there is a huge difference between this game and what it will be a year, two years, three years from now. Just like there is a big difference in what the game Star Citizen is now and what it will be 18 months, a year, well, a year, 18 months, or two years from now. And... One of the things that I see is that Chris Roberts over at Star Citizen, over at Cloud Imperium Games, isn't willing to put out the game before it's done. And where they're calling things modules and putting them out in pieces, Arena Commander, Hangar Module, well, the Hangar Module, the Dogfighting Module, a.k.a. Arena Commander, Commander the Racing Module, a.k.a. Um, New Horizons, which was integrated into the Arena Commander, First Person Shooter Module, the Planetary Module or Planicide Module, the Social Module, and then Squadron 42. 
each one of those things will come out and then the persistent world will be built and it will enter alpha and then beta testing of that. Well, frontier developments took a different pathway. And yes, I might be wrong about this. But their pathway was more based on not putting out a game in modules and calling it alpha, but getting it to a release version of an alpha. And yes, it works. So let's take that word away, alpha, of a working beta, kind of like how Microsoft puts out Windows all the time. And it's not feature complete, which would make it an alpha, right? So I'm kind of confused. So they're saying that this is the game. But in the future, you'll be able to land on planets. You'll be able to walk around space stations. You'll be able to take over other people's ships. And you'll be able to have some kind of first-person shooter action. All right. So you get all these people talking about how far along the um, Elite Dangerous is, which I could be one of them, so I support the game fully. And then you look at the actual feature set and realize it's no different than Star Citizen. It's a, got a little bit of a head start. They have the working components all out there. The trading system is out. The dogfighting system is out. But it's missing some promised features, right? And some features, kind of like what Star Citizen has done, have actually been taken away. So why am I contrasting these two games? Because there's a huge section of people on both sides that are saying, my game's better, my game's better, my game's better, my game's better. I think they're both wonderful games. Is one better than the other? It will be in your own opinion. And your opinion is yours, not everybody's, right? So what do I think? I'm having a blast in Elite Dangerous. I'm also having an amazing time in Star Citizen. But I'm spending more time in Elite Dangerous. Why? Because more of the game is done. And when Star Citizen reaches the point where they have hangar module, dogfighting module, first-person shooter module, planetside module, and social module all done, which still is not feature complete, I'll be in that a lot, having a blast of a time. I love that these two games are here. I love that these two games are here now. And what I'm going to tell you is very important, and you need to understand this, for this genre to go forward. We, as a community of space sim lovers, need both of these games to succeed. Anything without competition isn't worth it. Anything without a competitor trying to beat it doesn't get better itself. We need both of these games to succeed, and we need them both to push, push each other to get better. Push each other to challenge the developers to innovate and come up with something different. And I think that's exactly what they're doing. Hey, Chris Roberts supports Elite Dangerous. And David Braben supports Star Citizen. They know it. They see the writing on the wall. They need these games to succeed in order for their own games to succeed. I can't wait to see what the next two years bring as I'm able to fly into the far reaches of the galaxy when nobody is gone because there's 400 billion planets in Elite and land on a planet and name it myself or as I'm jumping around Star Citizen and I'm in the galaxy and come across a jump point that nobody even said was there and I'm flying around in my Carrick at this point and jump through it and find a new star system and get to name it myself. Both of these games are going to be amazing in their own ways. That's all I'm saying. So for those of you that are going back and forth with each other, saying which one's better, I love that you have passion about your game. I really do. But take a step back and take a look at the other side and see if it's good. Because you might find something that you like there that you then bring to the attention of the developers of the other game so they could try to make it better in their game. And I think that is the part that I like. All right, so is it okay that this is the way that I'm bringing these two things together? I talk about Star Citizen. I talk about Elite Dangerous. I think I could do this. And I really will like this format and hope you all do too. So what else is going on? Well, this week is Black Friday week and I work in retail. I am going to get 
a couple of videos out this week for both games. I've already done four videos for Elite Dangerous, <laughs> but I'm doing my show, shooting my show, Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous on Tuesday, because after Tuesday, there's no way I'm shooting that. Wednesday, Ben is committed to me that he will do five for the chairman, uh, sorry, five for the chairman, five for the CM with me. And I'm still looking for more questions. I've got a couple of good ones, but I want to see if you guys could bring any questions to light from what I talked about at the beginning of this. The $100 million and also possibly the um, ships, like how they came up with the pricing of the ships and what they think is right. So if you want questions answered along those lines, please send them. I also intend on doing a couple of, a couple of videos on the different ships that are for sale right now, and definitely the Carrick as we get closer to that sale. Something to remember, these ships that are for sale right now, each one is very unique, each one is a limited edition. The five original ship all have their limited versions for sale this week and that will be the Aurora LX, the 350R, the Hornet, F7CM Super Hornet I should say, the Freelancer MIS, and the Const well the Constellation doesn't have the Phoenix that was a very limited ship right that is not for sale but four of the five originals and the Cutlass came back and then you have the Banu Merchantman, you have the Cart 2, you have the Caterpillar, which I know a lot of people are eagerly awaiting. If you're not awaiting that one, you're probably waiting on the Starfare. I know I probably forgot a ship or two, but those are the ones that matter. Coming up next Friday, two concept ship sales go on, you know, go live. One of them is going to be very limited. $2,500 for a ship. So I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to talk a little bit about this when I talk about the Javelin next week. Think of the Javelin not as a ship, but as a guild hall. Think of it as a guild capital ship, as an organization capital ship. It's not going to be armed until you actually spend a lot of time, and they're talking an immense amount of invested time, to get the weapons to man it. But what it really is, is the meeting place, the holding place, your place for your organization. That's the way I read between the lines, and that's my question that I'm going to ask Ben this week and see what he has to say. All right, I think I talked myself into a corner over here because I started off talking about one thing and then started talking about this. Um, the Javelin is real estate. You're buying real estate in the game. That's what it is, and I think it's a good idea for the people that have the money, for the organizations that want to raise the money, but it's something that I know that I am not going to be part of. But I will be part of the Carrick for 345 if I could raise the money. Now, you guys have been helping me out a lot with Patreon and also giving me donations every now and then. And I have gotten to the point where I could actually pay my monthly bill for the three or four things that I do. For the podcast, for the videos, my... Um, Upload and download bandwidth has been very expensive, so I got that covered at this point. I also had to buy a hard drive this month and a webcam for my PC, so that's all been covered. That leaves me a little drive for a Carrick. I'm thinking, do I melt a ship, or do I just wait for the next concept sale? What do you guys think? I don't think I should actually take money I don't have around Christmas and buy it. And it's not going to kill me not to have it right now, because you know what? It's not in the game. But at some point, when it comes back around, that baby will be mine, and it will be in my hangar. All right, I will be back on Tuesday, and I hope all of you have a wonderful next few days. And please get those questions from me for Ben. And with that said, you all be safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon.